A stay-at-home mom on TikTok listed out the things her family can no longer afford because of the rising costs of, well, everything. As we all know, inflation has been brutal the past three years, and in just the last year, the costs of everything have gone up 3.7% across the board. Add to that the fact that salaries are not increasing to keep up with inflation, and things are tight for many families. This mom, who goes by Alex's Here One on TikTok, listed out the eight things her family can no longer afford, which range from subscription services, to dining out, to even her having a job. And she's not alone. Commenters on her video wonder what's next after people have already given up all the extras and are down to the basic necessities they need to survive. An average American income is around $71,000 a year, and remember, that's just the average. But the average American believes that a family of four needs an annual income of $85,000 a year just to get by, according to a recent Gallup poll. The gap between what Americans think they need to get by and what they actually earn seems to be growing. And for many, just getting by is getting harder and harder. So how are you managing to make do in the current situation? What cuts have you had to make in order to get by? Buying a coffee treat is a totally okay financial decision. And despite what some in former generations may say, it's not destroying your finances. In a post by Jess Boyer posted to the Female Quotient Instagram account, she posits that it's not your cold brew habit that is keeping you from affording to buy a house. It says, annual reminder that one vanilla sweet cream cold brew from Starbucks a week is $252 a year and over 10 years, $2,520, which is not enough to get anywhere near a down payment on a house, even as prices cool. So if that splurge keeps you going when work makes you want to scream, you do you. If it keeps you sane, it's not a waste of money. Besides, the coffee isn't the problem. The increased cost of living combined with an unstable economy means it's harder than ever for people to support themselves on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone save up for something like a house. Comments on the Instagram post ran along both sides of the spectrum, coming from both those in the buy the coffee treat camp to those who thought that saving was more valuable. Valuable. But buying a coffee and affording daily survival should not be mutually exclusive. As one person stated, I actually don't think it's unreasonable to expect to be able to afford a coffee and still have enough to live. Perhaps the real issue is systemic inequality not personal financial decisions. So next time you start to feel guilty for buying that coffee treat, remind yourself that life is for living and that it's okay to sometimes spend your money on things that make you happy. A couple making $180,000 a year is having trouble making ends meet because they spend $80,000 a year on childcare. The husband called into the Dave Ramsey show to ask for advice, but all he got was ridiculed. The man described his family's financial situation and Ramsey seemed perplexed that they couldn't get by on $180,000 a year. It seems like a lot, right? The man then broke down his daycare costs saying that it cost $25,000 per kid per year in tuition and then they pay for before and after care and then care doesn't go in the summer so they need a nanny. Ramsey told this man, you guys have lost your minds. But it shows just how little Ramsey understands about the extremely high cost of childcare in the United States. A TikToker named Paige Connell had some words about Ramsey's perspective stating that since he's supposed to be an expert in his field, surely he would know that childcare is the number one rising cost for families in this country. Connell also pointed out that in some states, there's a severe lack of accessible childcare, which means that families will pay whatever they have to in order to have it. Childcare costs have increased by 220% in the last 30 years, and the economy loses $122 billion a year due to childcare disruptions. Connell offered what she sees as a solution to this major economic crisis, government-subsidized childcare. What do you think? How are you dealing with increasing childcare costs? Child care costs more than college tuition in more than half of U.S. states. Care.com recently released the 2024 Cost of Care Report, and the results are jaw-dropping. About 47% of parents are spending up to $18,000 a year on child care, while 20% reported spending over $36,000 annually. The cost of care for babies and toddlers? It's more than parents would pay for four years of in-state public university that includes tuition, fees, room, and board. In fact, parents are paying, on average, 
charge $1,031 more a year for childcare than the cost of public college tuition. On average, families spend 24% of their income on childcare when, according to the government, affordable childcare should be no more than 7%. We've reached a breaking point with the childcare crisis and it affects more than just parents. According to Care.com CEO Brad Wilson, it's a system failure that impacts our country's economic growth. As parents are forced into a financial hole the first five years of their children's lives. And according to economist Keisha Blair, the United States has the most educated workforce of women in the labor market, but the lowest labor force participation rate of women. And we don't even have time to go into how the pandemic affected child care centers, but let's just say with the expiration of federal funding in September of 2023, child care spots and jobs for child care providers are disappearing. This issue goes beyond just parents. It's about what we expect from our institutions and how we're cared for by the powers that be. We should all be outraged whether we have kids or not. A woman says she's exhausted by the fact that she can't afford rent even though she's cut back on eating in order to pay her bills. TikToker Aura Hardesty, like so many of us, was already struggling in today's economy. But then her rent increased by $500 a month overnight, going from $1,300 to $1,800. And as someone who grew up poor, she knows how to budget. But that huge rent increase has made cutting back even more impossible. And it's left her feeling the same way a lot of Americans feel right now, that she's overworked and underpaid. But weirdly, people on TikTok gave her a lot of blowback for sharing her situation. They accused her of secretly not having a job. They accused her of secretly being rich because she has a washer and dryer. One person even scolded her for using her ceiling fan. The whole thing was very weird. It's not like her struggles are unique. Food prices are still going up because corporations keep gouging us while pretending it's inflation. The national median rent is about $200 higher than it was three years ago. And even though rents have thankfully finally been declining for months, several studies have revealed that half of U.S. tenants can't afford their rent. Why are we still pointing fingers at struggling people and scolding them for having their hair combed, something some Yahoo literally yelled at this woman in her comments, instead of banding together to get mad at the people actually responsible for the system that's grinding us all to dust? The National Park Service, just kidding, I mean the people in Washington. Quit yelling at her and go call your reps or something. Nobody should have to cut back on eating only to still not be able to make ends meet. And unless you're a literal one percenter, you're a lot closer to that dilemma than you realize. You should be on her side. A woman thinks that people who work low-paying jobs shouldn't own expensive designer bags. TikToker Destiny showed us that she's not impressed by things like brand name shoes, outfits, or Louis Vuitton bags because she feels that rich people don't have to go that hard to prove their wealth. But she claims people who work low-paying jobs like, say, customer service at T-Mobile, her example, should be saving their money or spending it on something useful, not designer anything. She is simply not impressed if you own a $20,000 car but don't own a home. Shoda's video was met with bad backlash and criticism because, well, it's simply no one else's business how someone else spends their money. An accounting and finance professor who goes by Simply Doc T voiced her amazement at the things people are concerned about in today's economy, where people are struggling to put food on the table and find jobs. Her take? People should do what makes them happy, even if it's buy a Louis Vuitton bag on a low salary. We have no right to judge others when we're not signing their checks, paying their bills, or contributing to their expenses. It's simply not our business. A life coach named Shonda further criticized Shoda for assuming that people who work at T-Mobile are automatically broke. And furthermore, how do we even know how they got the bag? It could have been a gift or a reward or something else. She says that it's bold to assume that because someone owns a luxury item, they either can't afford it or don't deserve to own it. Life is incredibly short and no one should be policed by others when it comes to spending. And you know what they say about assumptions. Studies show that tons of us are stealing from self-checkout, but people are finding it really hard to care. Sure, that intrusive thought to slip something past the self-checkout has popped into all of our minds, but it turns out a lot more of us are actually doing it than we realize. Retailers say that theft has become a huge problem in stores that's eating into profits by wide margins, and a huge proportion of the problem lays squarely on self-checkouts, with a recent study finding that shoppers are 21 times more likely to get an item past a self-checkout than a human cashier, which is not exactly surprising given that human cashiers have eyes on all. And another study found that roughly one in seven shoppers admits to having purposefully stolen something from self-checkout. But an even higher proportion of thefts are accidental, with 20% of shoppers having stolen an item by forgetting to scan it or scanning it incorrectly. All that combined with how frequently the machines break down? It kind of seems like the real problem here is the self-checkout machines themselves, right? But rather than just get rid of them and hire more cashiers, most customers don't even like using them. Retailers are implementing ever more draconian anti-theft measures instead, from locking up 
merchandise to patrolling shoppers' receipts as they leave the store, which shoppers say they find offensive because it makes them feel like criminals. But stores have also taken to prosecuting even sincere self-checkout mistakes. Many lawyers urge shoppers to avoid self-checkouts at all costs for exactly this reason. But given all the inflation and price gouging we've been seeing, a lot of people simply don't care about the problem of stealing at self-checkouts. And honestly, who can blame them? A recent analysis of more than 1,300 companies by the Institute for Public Policy Research found that much of our inflation problems aren't inflation at all, but rather profiteering by corporations simply because they could, a phenomenon that has come to be known as greedflation, which is frankly a far more likely cause of all the theft that retailers are seeing. The bottom line is that if retailers really wanted to stop theft, they'd hire an adequate number of cashiers to serve their customers like it used to be and stop artificially inflating prices and put pressure on corporations and manufacturers who are doing so as well. Because at the end of the day, stealing from the self-checkout is just a symptom, not the disease. The USDA's recommended grocery budgets for a family of four have people feeling full-on gaslit. It's no secret, of course, that grocery prices have risen exponentially since 2020. But the USDA's recommended grocery budgets show a deep disconnect between the government's messaging and what we're all actually experiencing at the grocery checkout. Multiple times a year, the U.S. Department of Agriculture releases several food plans, supposedly based on actual food prices. TikToker Sarah Bigger Stewart has a great explainer of this if you're interested. But the basic gist is that these food plans are broken up into four tiers. Thrifty, which is used to determine food stamp benefits, low cost, moderate cost, and liberal meaning you don't really have to worry about what you're spending. These food tiers are based on the types of groceries you're buying, and the lower tiers allow for very few actually nutritious choices. Fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and high-quality meats, for example, those are only recommended for the big spenders, according to these plans. But the bigger problem is that the actual monetary figures for these budgets bear very little resemblance to what people are actually spending right now. We asked parents to share their grocery bills with us, and all of them said that they spend moderately, not depriving themselves, but cutting corners and finding discounts wherever they can. And because grocery prices vary so much region to region, we asked people all over the country, from Michigan to California, nobody's spending was even close to the USDA's recommended budgets. Even I, a single man who cuts every corner I can on groceries, spends about $500 a month, which is a full $50 more than the USDA says I should be spending if I'm not worrying about my grocery bill at all, buying, you know, caviar and artisanal kale or whatever. There's a very simple reason for the disconnect between the sunny economic numbers provided by our leaders and the anger the public seems to be feeling about the economy. Many of those numbers, like the ones for groceries, simply don't accord with people's lived realities. And insisting that we should feel better about the economy isn't going to do anything to fix these disconnects or the problems that stem from them. Instead, our leaders in Washington might want to try actually explaining what they plan to do about these problems, other than lay blame on each other, that is. Because people are really tired of being gaslit. Is $100,000 really enough to support a family in today's economy? TikToker Blair Allison isn't so sure. She shared that she used to think making six figures would be a dream come true, but now that she's actually living that life, it's not at all how she envisioned. And she pointed out the problems that we're all facing. The cost of living is up while wages have stagnated for years. And while that is starting to improve, it's not making much of an impact on the people who need it most. All these problems have left Allison and many others feeling like $100,000 really isn't enough anymore for a family to live comfortably rather than paycheck to paycheck without going into major debt. Of course, this probably sounds shocking to most of us. The Census Bureau said the median income in 2022 was $74,580 after all. And that's just the median, which means a lot of us are making far less. Still, the math shows that Allison is right. Financial expert Sam Dojan, for instance, crunched the numbers and he found that families need more like $300,000 a year to actually be financially comfortable and remain safely within the middle class. Now, he was using expensive metropolitan metropolitan areas like those on the coast, for his example, so your mileage may vary depending on where you live. But it still illustrates how the median income at less than a third of that is a far cry from financial comfort these days. And if the overwhelming response to Allison's video is any indication, even people pulling down six figures are struggling in today's economy. So what about you? How are you getting along right now? The salary you need to make today to live like your parents did 40 years ago making 30k a year is totally depressing. In a TikTok video, financial expert Robert Gill explained that adjusted for inflation, please sit down and have your emotional support person on standby before proceeding, you'd have to make $162,342 to have the same purchasing power. Now, it's important to understand that inflation isn't just the prices of things going up. It's also the broader price increases across sectors, industries, and ultimately an entire country's economy in general. So it's not just that 
say housing prices are up since 1983, a dollar is actually worth less than it was previously. This is why we're all feeling the pinch, and also why our parents don't seem to get it. Boomers telling us to work harder isn't going to suddenly make our dollars worth more. Which led several commenters to ask Gil the question probably on everyone's mind. Does inflation ever really go down? His response? It hasn't in the last 40 years. And this of course means that as the value of our money continues to decrease, the amount of money needed to live a stable life will continue to increase. And unless we do something, like say reigning in corporate power by having reasonable corporate tax rates like the ones we had even during the beloved Reagan era, for instance, a comfortable life on a normal salary will become more and more unattainable to us average folks.